This meeting is being recorded. So thank you guys so much um, for spending your lunch time with us at Qualab's third lunch talk this semester. My name is Mia Mian Fei, and I am a graduate research associate at the Qualab, a research center focusing on advancing qualitative inquiry towards innovation, equity, diversity, and justice at the Ohio State University's College of Education and Human Ecology. Joining us today is Dr. Mirka Koro from the Mary Lowe Fulton Teachers College at the Arizona State University. Her presentation today is on creative, relational, and hesitant methodologies for qualitative inquiry. So before we start, uh, we wish to acknowledge that the land of the Ohio State University is located on the traditional homeland of the Shawnee, uh, Miami, Nenape, and Wyandotte nations and other indigenous nations who have strong ties to this land. Um, today's agenda is very straightforward. We will first have some words of welcome and an introduction to the core lab from our director, Dr. Penny A. Pasque. Um, I will then say a few housekeeping rules for the lunch talk before Dr. Um, Coral gives her presentation. We will have a Q&A session um, at the end, so you will have the opportunity to ask questions. And I will close today's lunch talk by telling you how you can get involved in the core lab. So Dr. Pasque, please take it away by welcoming all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're here. The Qual Lab is a methodology center here at The Ohio State University. And we started in 2020, so right around the time of COVID. So at that point, we put a lot of these lunches up online and our dashboard of resources. We have so much information, I think, um, it's, uh, for you that this group of fabulous Jerry's has collected. We also do series like the Qualab Lunch. We have the Advanced Methods Institute that will be coming up in 2023 in June. We'll share a bit of information about that uh, as things um, unfold. And we also provide one-on-one -on -one consultations. Really, the Dean has uh, brought me in to make sure that we're elevating qualitative research throughout the college, working with faculty, postdocs, and grad students we also end up working with people outside uh, if uh, that's fee-based. I guess it's just such a small, small group that we can offer it for people within the college for free. And then some people do uh, seek our services outside. But um, anything that we come across, we try to make sure that it's up and tweeted out and it's on our dashboard and there's many videos and things available for you. And it really is because of the strength of this fabulous team. I just think so highly of them. And with that, I'm very excited about today. So I'm not going to do the introductions, but I'm going to pass it back to Mian Mian. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasquay. Thanks for your kind words. Um, so just a few more housekeeping items before we start. Um, so please turn off your microphone during the presentation, but please feel free to share any questions or comments using the chat space. Dr. Coral will also address your questions during the Q&A session after her presentation, or you can and you can just turn on your microphone and raise a question directly towards her. Um, I want to draw your attention that this session is being recorded and you will be able to access the recording on our YouTube channel after the session. Um, closed captioning is provided during the session. Um, you can enable the functions at the bottom right corner of your video box. So now uh, let's welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Mirka Koro. Um, before she starts, I will have the honor and pleasure to introduce her. So Dr. Mirka Koro is a professor of qualitative research and director of doctoral programs at the Mary Lowe Food and Teachers College at the Arizona State University. Um, she receives her PhD from the University of Helsinki. Um, her scholarship operates in the intersection of qualitative inquiry, methodologies, philosophy, and social cultural critique. She has published in various qualitative, methodological, and educational journals, and authored and co-edited a number of books on qualitative inquiry, which um, I will share with you at the end of today's presentation. Again, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Coral. Um, the floor is yours.
Thank you so much for inviting me. What a great pleasure to be here. Um, Kuala is a wonderful place to share information, have reflective conversations and learn, especially together. So that's why we are here today. And uh, I'm gonna share my um, work in progress thoughts about three things that I find really dear to my kind of qualitative inquiry. Uh, being creativity, uh, relationality, and hesitation and slowness. But let me share first my screen so we can get started. Looking good in that end? All right. And uh, just also I want to welcome everybody in Finnish. Tervetuloa tähän um, esitykseen ja ne, jotka puhuu suomea, niin ihana, että olette täällä. Kiitoksia ja terveitä aamusesta Arizonasta. Um, I, I have prepared some provocations and kind of breaks for us, but I have also written the paper, so bear with me. Uh, I sometimes I feel like language um, for me, as, as a non-native uh, English speaker, I, I need to I need to work myself through my text. So therefore, I am kind of reading from the script a little bit, but then also having some breaks for you to do other things. So let's get started. Um, qualitative inquiry has vitality and methodological and ontological potential to prom promote difference and address complexity. In this presentation, I will focus on the three elements that are already mentioned, which makes qualitative research process more sustainable and vitally responsive. I call for inquiries which can create and recreate themselves and vision alternatives for more equitable and diversified futures. I discuss the role of relationality and responsibility when complex knowledge and layered yet situational worldings are being created. And finally, I introduce hesitance as a mode of being, doing, and becoming in the context of responsive qualitative inquiry. Uh, I think we want to start from the place that what is our world like? And so our world is currently highly complicated and complex. It has layers and different perspectives and variety of different kinds of politics, economies, and ecologies, and this multiplicity, which is always already there. And I find it quite disheartening to see that this richness of this complexity is sometimes reduced to the factors and correlations and numbers and themes and normative discourses and sameness. It is not enough that we address this shifting complexity via past and existing tools and processes. We need new tools um, to meet the needs of this new infinitively complex problem space. We need to think what it means, what does it take, and how it is possible to engage in a methodological work that is building on diversity, including, for example, neurodiversity as a baseline, and a difference as a celebrated space for relationality and relating. We don't have only multiple answers, but also very multiple diversifying questions, and these different spaces where we become and relate. Or maybe we only have questions and this responsibility to act. And some of this context really is there with me every day that I'm doing qualitative inquiry. One other challenge related to any inquiry, especially when teaching future generations of qualitative research, has to do with the futuristic thinking. In many ways, we need to move beyond our methodological past while still being informed by them. And that's the challenge. And critically evaluate what are the challenges and method methodological dilemmas of the futures. We are often very willing to learn the process of inquiry, hoping that now we know and we master methods. However, our responsibility as a methodologist and researchers does not end there. We also need to vision these methodological tomorrows, the next year, and anticipate how the following decades offer us unthinkable methodological possibilities and challenges. 
in some ways, all inquiries ideally function as inquiries for the future. Methodological presence, meaning current methods, strategies, approaches, techniques, is only shaping what we know. And they should not be really dictating or limiting how we might know and do. This pulling force between the known and the unknown, past and the present, and so on, also marks the distinction between knowing and becoming methodologically. Furthermore, how could we adapt methodologically to fit our future vision of equitable and worthy lives for all, meaningful and responsible relationality across cultural, political, and economic landscapes, and vision futures, how could we vision futures to sustainable ecologies, both at the local and the global scale? Furthermore, who is entitled to vision and revision qualitative futures? And who is giving the task to try to try out creative, experimental, and innovative methods? How does the global South, for example, part participate in these creations? And how do indigenous scholars conceptualize wonder and materialize the inquiry in their own context? How do Sami people sing their ontologies and sense their data? Now is the time to stop for a second, and I want you to feel alive between. Much of my work the past 15 years has focused on creative forms of inquiry and methodolo uh, methodology addressing data, conferencing, knowing, doing, analysis, materiality, and, and much more. At some point of my career, I studied creativity, and now I more practice it in, a, in its various forms. For, me, for me, methodologies without creativity, adaptation, and without wild thinking are the methodologies of the norm, repetition, and also for me, boredom. Creativity brings this vitality. It produces surprise and wonder, and it makes me always hesitant and humble about the next steps and do direct, do not new directions. Also hesitant about the next relations and those others that I will meet uh, next. Creativity does not necessarily produce and create, but advances this feeling alive in between and within intervals. And this is coming from Whitehead. Creativity is making felt what is too often overlooked and too close. So it's interesting to think about creativity not as a productivity or aspect of element of productivity, but this uh, sensation or effect, like, like Whitehead explains to us. Furthermore, to move towards creative ways of inquiry and becoming with inquiry in its all forms, speculation is in, has been a very helpful technique for me, and it's also very hard to do. One needs to go to see and go beyond oneself. How can we do that? Uh, one ought to think with half-baked plans and risky opportunities, and it's also called to follow the, the path of a known. Qualitative scholars could, for example, um, from this speculative perspective, utilize a, what I call what if frameworks, scenario building. Uh, they could build endlessly varied and open ended methodological engagements, promote various forms of anticipation through their work, 
uh, build on crowdsourcing, flash mobs, these very participatory aspects of work, uh, use speculative art, and so on, to collectively imagine alternative pathways, structures, and, and futures. What if interviews had no sound? The visual materials were studied through touch. Companion species could co-design inquiries, or research could focus on care rather than data collection. Now we're going to do a little breathing exercise. Just follow the instructions on the screen. We're not going to do three minutes. <laughs> Thank you for joining for this uh, moment. Um, I also want to say that uh, when we did a uh, book on data and different kind of extension and forms of data, there was a very, very interesting article about breath and breathing as a form of data. And that has that has that is just the one example of how I try to think with the body while I'm engaging in, in, in qualitative projects. Furthermore, to, uh, to move towards creative ways of building an uh, inquiry and, and becoming with the inquiry. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I already got there. Um, sorry. Relationality is another actualization of vitality. Engaging in qualitative process with others, relating through caring and touch, and relating through word and, and responsible actions um, build a better world for all of us. For example, much of my late work includes collaborations with the diverse scholars from different geographical areas as well as different disciplines. And I, for example, the academic conference machine work that we have been doing with the European colleagues. This has been really continuous source of joy, laughter and creative practice. I don't think that individualism, methodological authority or individual driven methodological work is going to help us to take the field of qualitative research and post-qualitative research towards new directions or vision possibilities for this unthinkable that we are trying to, in some way, approach. Um, instead, we need collective responsibility and collective uh, uh, recreation of and within methodological spaces and worlds. Interdisciplinarity can be an option and responsibility driven by engagement allow, allow multiple perspectives to unite in the ways that are beyond any single or simple understanding. True interdisciplinary relations, unthinkable can become thinkable, wild, stay wild, wonder creep into everydayness and minor gestures and forces can become potentially more recognizable and used as a vitalizing elements. Furthermore, from my perspective, relationality and empathy are other necessary conditions for any relationship researchers form within and outside their worlds. Relationality is an exchange. It's a movement between the elements and force between the spaces. Relational methodologies enable scholars to function in the middle and begin, begin wherever they are or where their participants are. I also am thinking about relationality and relating beyond the human, like I already mentioned. These kind of practices decenter human and relate to the companion species and other material realities that surround us every day. 
go out and research or sense their belonging with the earth. So they take responsibility of ecological crisis and they relate even to the less familiar species, sometimes like moths or viruses or dust. We could think about relationality as these ecological tasks and part of a material eventhood. We are wrapped in these events that keep folding and unfolding, and we are part of all that kind of ecosystem. Furthermore, relationality is always related to the ethics and responsibility. Here I draw from Haraway and uh, her notion of responsibility. Qualitative researchers need to be capable uh, to be responsive, to negotiate, and to see beyond their own perspective, beyond the individual, and think about collective values and collective forms of living and importance of shared lives. Research and inquiry happen in shared research spaces. Information and knowledge bring these sense in living subjects together. And the world of research does not end uh, with us. This form of relational thinking can be especially challenging for us academics because so many of researchers are trained individually and our academic awards are individually aligned. Yet at the same time, if qualitative researchers move towards more serious, respectable and sustainable relationality, many forms of academic and uh, scholarship practice needs to be rethought and renegotiated. For example, open access is, is a great idea, but it has turned in many ways into this capitalistic enterprise and a Western project. It is quite sad to me to see how such an ideologically uh, equitable knowledge exchange has been taken over by profit-driven publishing companies and knowledge generation giants and libraries that gatekeep the access choose even deepening the divide between the wealthy and the poor and the North and the South, those that are included and excluded, those that are mainstream are not mainstream, et cetera. How, will, how might we need to consider, for example, authorship? When we move into relational spaces and global knowledge exchanges, what languages should we use to share our scholarship? I have been really interested about this problem of English dominance also in the field of science, but qualitative research. 98% of all scientific communication is in English. And I have colleagues in Finland who never publish. I have published one article in Finnish and Finnish is my native language. I, it, it's hardening, disheartening to me. Um, who owns a method, a study, and who benefits from the knowledge that are currently being produced? Can we move beyond the constraints of this uber individualism and Western driven neo capitalism? How might we vision ontologically different futures? For me, relationality is also a practice which acknowledges that scholars do not produce knowledge separate from living. Bringing, bringing living to the scholarship care to all relations and ontology to epistemology forces us to take the responsibility of the lives we live, we create and the methodological choices we make. The kind of pre-epistemology or post-ontology practices, they can make a difference, enable us to vision alternative and potential futures. Every action, research, um, form of inquiry, choice is a statement about our values and preferences. Currently, I work in the research team with, in collaboration with the teachers and principal, aims to build more equitable access to music for students from disadvantaged uh, circumstances. Our work in, with the Rosie's House, which is a musical school in downtown Phoenix, offers free uh, music lessons for children and youth. It, uh, it problematizes the privilege and troubles social and discursively acceptable experiences of music and creativity. What does this choice of, of the study context tell about my values as a researcher? Where do I want to invest my time? Who do I want to work with and who needs our help to improve the lives and strengthen communities? For me, change and transformation start small from these micro moments and minor gestures, from invisible forces that collectively they do accumulate. 
When scholars put the needs of the community and participants in the front of their own needs, something important is about to happen. This also calls for giving up our privilege and negotiating and questioning those taking for granted notions of inquiry that we'd also find the dearest. Scholars may need to think more about the methods that are suitable and needed for the participants and communities, but could be quite inconvenient for us. Um, how we go about that type of research. Uh, similarly, it's important to consider desire and socially given tasks to, to, that is given to us as a researchers in the public universities. How do we give back to the communities and academia and how we help to build a new generation of qualitative scholars? and how senior scholars like me, we could pull aside, put aside the CV building and build the CVs of junior scholars. So those are important questions and really close to my heart in terms of mentoring and um, all that. Why I can't get off my, okay, I did, perfect. Um, let's listen. Here. before I get to the next one. Play. All right. Uh, my last point relates to the hesitation and slowness and taking time with the projects and data and building relationships. I have frequently encountered instances where, and you have too, I'm sure, <laughs> where um, I have been asked to be extremely uh, effective, to be accountable, uh, design research budgets that save university money or generate more income, work in the ways that adds to the productivity of my unit. I have been asked to do rapid research and told that my scholarship and scholarly existence is being evaluated based on quantity and speed. I have been told multiple times, do not slow down, um, don't hesitate, don't waste time, but be productive. Hope that many people will attend your talks and presentations so that the titles will be retweeted and celebrated. And the greatest number of other human beings are impacted by your work, and that being the ultimate goal. Tenure and promotion process beautifully grooms us to do these tasks. And this makes me quite sad and, and somewhat disappointed. <laughs> um, Following strangers, I believe in partial connections and this transformation of incomplete and participation of the unfinished. Those are the things that excite me, not the task of being speedy, fast, and effective. I want to resist speed and this increasing financial accountability. I want to believe that in other science, these are being possible. And I echo Stenger's desire to call out all inconvenience truths through the qualitative and critical inquiry. 
So maybe we just ask, we can go unite and cooperate, um, diversify, but don't make assumptions. Slowness would also enable qualitative scholars to better address the multiplicity and stay with the complexity of events and processes. I find it quite paradoxical and also interesting that slowness is hard, even more challenging than speed, because one needs to really think critically and come to the conclusion that, oh my God, I need to slow down. And that slowing is needed and necessary. The slowness calls for this attentiveness and care. And it's so easy to just approach methodology as this train that is always already knowing where it goes and stays on the track. Um, but slowness uh, reflects the relation in time and it enables a different notion of time, which is really interesting to me. Um, I have also noticed many other enabling effects of hesitance. Well, let's, let's, start, let's talk first about the ethics. When we engage in this slow and hesitant scholarship, I need to view ethics far beyond the duty and rule following. Hesitant scholarship is unpredictable and uncertain. I have to make a choice. And I'm, I'm drawing from Derrida here where ethics is this facing the unknown and, and the need to de decide when the choice is not given. I'm faced with a situation where I'm not quite sure what's the right thing to do. And that's the ethics in a kind of a nutshell. What's the best method to use? Well, how do I slow, slowly acknowledge the complexity of our lives and the lives of the participants in our communities? How might hesitation bring, what might hesitation bring to the inquiries and our role as a researcher? And how might I find joy in this slowness? And, and how might I also slowly um, fail and try and retry? Slowness and hesitance also could mean that I'm taking time to think through my decisions. Sometimes hesitance leads to the risks and sometimes there are multiple plan Ps. Hesitance may also promote relearning and cultivating different and renowned uh, relations. And I think that's important to me too. Uh, qualitative research takes time as we know. And sometimes it's really uncertain for how long. I, I'm not sure how long it takes to analyze the data or interact with this piece of uh, environment that I'm part of. I think there's also something said about spending unlimited time and timeless time with something. And to the point where you feel like you are wasting time. I do this often, especially with the data analysis and I use data far beyond its use value. A data may provoke, return, and disappear. A sentence is an Im images seems so full of life until I can see no longer any life in them. Then it's time to, to waste. Manning refers to the pragmatics of the useless. She notes that a pragmatics of the useless celebrates the shared experience that is affirmed not because of what it is, but because of how it affects experience in making. This howness, whenness, witness, and becomingness of qualitative inquiry is a vital uh, element of the process. These acts of being with it, sitting with it, thinking with, sensing with, nest call of, or scholars who are capable of resisting and demands of linear time.
This presence and being with also troubles the use of value of inquiry. Hesitant scholarship always moves beyond the direct use of the value of the method, research project and researcher towards power to generate a more of the life and to be open to potential. Hesitation also relates to the vulnerability that I do not know, but I will engage with. I affect and I'm being affected in unanticipated ways. Hesitation and slowing down enables me to care and love across borders, care about environments and companion species, care about our planet, care about others in deep ways, care about different functions and possibilities of responsible scholarship, and care enough about reading and researching to slow them and us down. This is the kind of world that I would like to live and practice qualitative inquiry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coral, for uh, this very creative, very new presentation for me. Um, I will now open the floor um, to all the audience for questions. So please just unmute yourself um, if you have a question to raise. And if you don't think of one, I will think of one. So I'd really rather <laughs> think of with one. all of you. <laughs> and not, not just a conversation between the two of us. Maybe this will give you a little second. I've got one. Please. So thanks so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I heard you say a couple of times that you feel sad at the realities of the qualitative research landscape as it is. So I'm curious how you kind of sit with that sadness and maybe negotiate when to be involved in the qualitative research world as a profession versus like take a step away from it. That's a really good question. And I hope that I didn't come across as overly pessimistic. Uh, I, I, I think that what, it, what, is, what is really, challenging to me is I have in the one hand, I have these uh, institutional conditions under which qualitative research and qualitative inquiry, post qualitative research and inquiry is kind of operating. And then I have this extremely deep love <laughs> towards, towards qualitative inquiry and this, this passion and I see the possibilities and where it could go and what could it do. And I hear it from the participants and communities I work in that this is, oh, we love, you know, what you are doing and this is so important. So how to carve a space in that, that really contradictory space and how to work there slowly and, and still uh, feeling kind of satisfaction about the work that you're doing. I, 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 it's a decision every morning I wake up. It's like, okay, well, how, how I go about this today? And I think that it is uh, these situational factors that they also change daily and, and more frequently than that. So I, I think it's, it's, it's like with all the research that how do we balance life, uh, loving, care, work, uh, inquiry in a ways that, um, enables us to do what we want to do. Um, I don't I don't have answers. I have just a lot of questions and wonderings and things that and maybe things that I, I do uh, personally, but you might not find them helpful at all. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's it's a challenging play. Yeah. And I think academia overall today is a very challenging place to work and do work. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I kind of appreciate the answer of like, you don't even have it all figured out, even though you've got uh, no. these really <laughs> interesting not, yeah. ideas. Um, yeah, and I think the work that you're doing does carve out space for new qualitative researchers like me who are like, oh, I feel really let down by this space or this, you know, I, I felt creative and open in a space and then something will happen that I'm like, I need to hurry up, I need to be productive, I need to figure out my whole dissertation by a certain period of time. 
Yeah. Um, so knowing that you're like promoting this type of research is really helpful from from the student perspective. Thank you. I haven't had really chance to monitor the chat. So if there's anything um, that you you guys want to be addressed, just do it. Uh, we have a question from um, NJ. Um, if you want to raise the question yourself, you can feel free to unmute yourself. Good, uh, good morning here in California. Um, I, I'm wondering, I, so I teach in a graduate program um, and I'm teaching the research course, the introduction, introductory research course. Mm -hmm. um, the struggle that I see for our students is that we're, we're so intent on on um, giving them a kind of standard knowledge that forces them, uh, just as our previous question asker mentioned, right, that kind of forces them into this quick thinking about what are they going to make, um, you know, what their thesis is going to look like, or their dissertation. And oftentimes, um, well, it seems that um, our students are making choices uh, quickly mm -hmm. without having had a moment to really digest or integrate um, concepts or their own aspirations, even to like, even to decipher what their own aspirations are for um, themselves, their families, the communities in which they live. Um, and so I'm wondering, how do you what would you recommend in terms of um, bringing in this idea of stillness or hesitance, hesitancy and troubling these, um, these you know, quick decision-making efforts uh, that the institution so often promotes? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, it's, it's a really good question. And uh, I think I'm, I'm thinking about it very often when I'm teaching in the classroom. Um, and I, I can again speak from how I have solved the problem or continue to kind of uh, dealing with it. I think for me it is, it's about finding a balance. So I have found that it is, it, it's impossible for me to take students within, uh, within these current conditions of pressure to graduate and, and quickly come up with the research design, et cetera. Take, take all that framework away and pluck them into the space of slowness. I, it, I haven't been able to do that. I, I'm not even able to do it myself. So I don't think I can ask that from the students. But I think what I try to do is to create those spaces. So create those times when we can take that break. And, and stay with the data or stay with the uh, one sentence that the participants said or take that deep breath and, and, and do breathing and, and think through, okay, what, what, that, what is really my research question is here? So there are, there, are, there are, I think there are key elements of the research design, let's say deciding on your, your problem and your research question. Those are, those are the spaces where I do really encourage my students to take time and, and, and keep things in a flux. Uh, so yes, if you have to put something on the paper for your committee for this and the, put it down, but let's keep returning to it and, and take time to process it. And remember that it is not about mastery of the research question or mastery of the method, but the, it's about the process. And, and stay engaged with that process. So those finding those pockets and creating activities that allow students to slow down, whether it is in the design course or whether it's in their dissertation process or in their analysis phase. And sometimes it's hard to say, I would like you to come back to me in two weeks. <laughs> Don't come back tomorrow, come back in two weeks. So you have time to sit with it. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you, Dr. Curl, uh, and th thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I really learned a lot, and I think I slowed down quite a bit uh, during your talk. So thank you for the gift. Um, I do have a question um, because uh, you have traveled from University of Helsinki to uh, Arizona State University, and uh, there's a lot of differences I could imagine between these two locations. And you also talked about as a researcher, uh, you have discovered a lot of relationality of becoming um, this in, in this process. So uh, could you please share some of the, I don't know, wild research methodology that you thought of um, between these um, when you are traveling and traversing the landscapes? Um, I, I just can't put my head um, around the, the, the differences and um, I don't know, the diversity that you have in, experienced in your research journey. Oh, uh, thank you for the lovely question. Um, this, immediately when you started talking about it, it took me back to that um, rainforest experiment and that uh, we, we um, it was a, again, a group of scholars from Scandinavia and we got together at my dad's place um, in Nokia, which is, uh, uh, very close to the big forest, et cetera. And we wanted to experiment with darkness. And 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 when I'm, I, and, and we did, we went to the rainy forest and we um, kind of started thinking about ontological and epistemological, what kind of knowledge this space, this, this natural landscape and, and that landscape coming with, uh, together with us, we becoming it while we are there getting wet. And, not seeing each other and seeing nothing in the in the dark uh, November forest, I think it was. So that that kind of contextual and, and geographical space and the relationality that comes through that space is has been really important to me. And another example is that we were in Manchester in this um, uh, working. It was a factory, a pottery factory, and the conference was next door. And we went to this local space, and the way that the the research team came together in that geographical, um, metaphysical, and also material space was very unique, and um, it cannot be repeated. So those are those are kind of like unique experiences that bring people together in these geographical and cultural spaces, that is a really great source for, uh, a vital, vital source for me in some ways. So working across context and building these different relationships enables that type of scholarship, which is really, really cool and important. Um, and, the, and, and, and it's not so much, and just one more thing, it's not so much how the cultures are different or that I'm doing this comparison in my head that how people or academia operates in US or Finland or in Manchester, UK, it is more like utilizing the resources and the context and the space that is, is there while you are there. And, and, and building that into your work and, and, and collaborations. I think that is more my choice how to address that. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Dr. Coro, for this. I wanna go back to something you said toward the beginning of your talk, um, kind of on this temporality theme of, um, qualitative methodologies and how I think you said something like sort of the early or more linear ways of doing qualitative research are not going to be the pathway toward more just worlds. And I agree with that. And I've just been thinking about the tension though, between those more linear methodologies still dominating so much yeah. of at least the educational research landscape. And I've been trying to use the metaphor of composting of, of like, what do we yeah. do with these, with these methodologies that still, they're sort of past, but how do we still work within like the fertile ground to grow yeah. something new? Um, so I'm just curious, one, if that metaphor resonates with you and how you see it in play, and if it doesn't, how you would describe kind of your relationship with more linear methodologies and in relation to the more non-linear work that you're doing. Uh -huh. Interesting, Chelsea, that you're mentioning the composting methodologies because I was telling before we started that today we actually have a work workshop from three to five Arizona time with this international collaborative that is looking at uh, 
composting methodologies. <laughs> so this is uh, really uh, close to my heart today uh, and, and has been also. It is, yes, I think the composting, uh, um, why in, in my work we have drawn towards that, it started with the kind of uh, bringing uh, the ecologies and uh, ecology and, and the nature to us um, more closely and, and, and how um, composting and the layering and also the vitality of the compost and the energy that is embedded in the material that is, is deemed useless or waste, it's very productive space. So, so for me, nonlinear met non methodologies, they always have those uh, elements of the linearity in there. And the, the, the linear methods that I might not find so exciting, I, I still can't stay away. They, they, they are there with us. They are guiding the work of many of our colleagues, and they are also in filtering. And I have been doing also very, very linear methodologies early on in my career, et cetera. So they, they are there, and, and they are also almost like the minor gesture or the minor force that is also shaping the non-linear, non nonlinear methodologies. And, and, and for me, it's also the stylistic choice. So it's a lifestyle, but it's also a style that what do I think, what kind of methods or methodological logic in a way is important for my work. And I find that the unlinear and nonlinear use of research, not, not, not doing the step-by-step, -step, but utilizing processes and ruptures and you know all that stuff, it, it is more in line in the way that I live my life. And that's why I'm drawn to it. Uh, but like I said, I'm still very much influenced uh, with the or by the linear methods and they're always already there. Thank you. And thanks for paving the way for those of us who also want to do more yeah. nonlinear work. Yeah. have a couple comments from the chat that I just want to make sure that you uh, don't miss. And uh, Jill from your university mentioned. Uh, Thanks, Jill, for coming. Yeah. <laughs> really thinking about and loving the concept of hesitance in research and also said thank you to you. Proud to be your colleague. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that that got shared in the space. Too. Thank you. What else? So here are early career scholars and scholars that actually aren't early career, I think, in this space at different levels. Um, how, so in the field, of higher ed, there's a lot on academic capitalism and this commodification of higher ed and work. And um, and I appreciate the questions before the, and your presentation about how to challenge that and really slow down and think and center yourself. And so with this juxtaposition um, mm -hmm. and we have people who are leaving the academy regularly yeah. because it's not such a wonderful space. And um, as somebody who writes about and thinks about working both from within and outside, right? Yeah. This idiosyncratic, we need it all. Yeah. Um, do you have thoughts for, uh, for this group in terms of within the academic space and making sure that we're thinking through whether it's tenure and promotion or mentoring or publication or things like, how could we make sure that the nonlinear we support and agree with uh, or want to do, if that's what people want to do, really operates in the space that doesn't keep tearing us down and makes us redo over here versus over here, but that there's yeah. a way to connect ourselves and not perform differently in a space such as this one. Do you have thoughts or advice for all of us? Yeah, just writing a couple of things down. Um, I think the, 
what I have found that has helped me and my colleagues and my students um, is uh, find your community. You know, uh, the, the, your, the, the community is not necessary the proximity to it, it. Don't define the community by the proximity. Think about community in different spaces, different times community as a virtual, community as physical, community, community as effective space. So find those spaces where there are people similar to, not sim necessarily similar to you, but have similar intentions or values or uh, goals. Um, then the other thing is resist when you can. So I, I think, um, I have I have found one of my most self frustrating things is that I, I realized afterwards that I was resisting when I my resistance did not make any difference. And, and then I feel like I am, I should be investing my resistance to, in, in those spaces where I actually feel like I can create opening and, and we can actually talk about nonlinear methods or the value of doing that type of work. Um, and, and the last thing is educate. I think we need to educate our colleagues and our friends and our families and, and the, the doc, daddy, doc, doc daycare or whatever, whatever the constituents that we are working with, um, that we educate them about equity or diversity or qualitative research or things that we find important and as a kind of functional elements of our society and necessary elements. Um, so we need to do a little bit of that education and advocacy work to uh, help each other. Thank you again, Dr. Coral, uh, for your engagement. So uh, before we close, um, I want to um, share with you the few books um, of qualitative inquiry author and co-edited uh, by Dr. Coral, and uh, you can find the links uh, in the chat to learn more about these books. And if you enjoyed today's lunch talk, we have one more coming up uh, this semester. Uh, the last collab launch talk this semester will be on Thursday, December 8th uh, at the same time. And uh, please sign up by scanning the QR code and you can also watch uh, the recordings of the previous talks on our YouTube channel. Um, so this marks uh, the very end of our launch talk today. Um, thank you all so much again for joining us and we hope to see you again at our next event. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you for hosting. Fabulous to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs>